It's easy to see why some people think that meditation encourages narcissism, a fascination with your own feelings, a fascination with your own thoughts, your own breath, as if that was all that mattered in the world. And it's not helped when the meditation is reduced to a certain formula, a certain technique that, again, just focuses on what you're feeling, what you're sensing. As if that were all the word of the practice. It's very easy for people to come to meditation and just say, well, what's in it for me? and not run into much that discourages that attitude. So it's important to reflect on a phrase in the Buddha's teachings on mindfulness, that when you're contemplating the body in and of itself, or feelings, mental qualities, states of mind, you do it both internally and externally. So in other words, it's not just your body, feelings, mind states, mental qualities. The bodies, feelings, mind states, and mental qualities of other people, other beings. And in contemplation here, it's important to remember the original meaning of mindfulness. It's not awareness. If it were awareness, there'd be a problem. How can you be aware of other people's feelings? How can you be aware of their mental qualities? You'd have to be psychic. And even then there's a question, well, what use would that be? Mindfulness doesn't mean awareness. It means to keep something in mind. As in that old phrase, to be ever mindful of the needs of others, you keep other people's needs in mind. It means you remember them, you hold them in mind. And the same with mindfulness practice. When you're focusing on the breath, you are mindful of the breath. It means to keep the breath in mind. The actual awareness of the mind, that's something that comes with samajanya. And so when you reflect on your, your body, it's also important to reflect on the bodies of others. Make comparisons. The same with feelings. And then the other foundations are establishings of mindfulness, the other frames of reference. To counteract our very unskillful ways of making comparisons, In other words, thinking that we're better than other people in terms of our body, or worse than other people in terms of our body. They're more beautiful than we are, younger than we are. That's being worse. Or the people who say, well, I'm better than other people from another race. Just because of the color of my skin, that's a very unskillful kind of comparison. I've got a better mind than other people. I've got a worse mind than other people. These are forms of conceit that the Buddha says are really unhelpful. Ways of comparing that either make you proud or make you discouraged, neither of which are useful emotions to bring to the path. And as you reflect on the different ways the Buddha has you think about other beings and compare themselves, compare their bodies and feelings and minds to yours, it's important to note that it's mainly the emotional reaction, the attitude that develops as you learn how to make useful comparisons. But you can develop some extremely important, very helpful emotions if you make comparisons in the right way. For instance, in the very first set of reflections on the body, there's a whole section where the Buddha has you reflect on the fact of the different parts you have in your body, starting from the nails, hair of the head, hair of the body, nails, teeth, skin, all the way into the innards. Then it has you reflect on other people's bodies to realize that if you were to base your superiority on your body. Exactly where is your liver superior to someone else's liver? Where is your skin superior to someone else's skin? 
It's all the same kind of stuff. As he once said, whoever would, on the basis of a body like this, considering all the things that are in the body and all the things that flow out of the body, whoever on the basis of a body like this would exalt himself and disparage others. What is that if not blindness? So that's one purpose of this reflection, is to get a sense of dispassion. Or you can reflect on dead bodies. And as I said, you realize that when you see the, a dead body in different stages of decomposition, you realize that's the fate of this body as well. If it doesn't get cremated right after death, then it's going to go through those stages too. That gives rise to two kinds of feelings. One is a sense of heedfulness, realizing you don't know how much more time you have. You don't have all the time in the world for anything. You've got a limited amount of time, you want to make the best use of it before this body, too, lies on the ground, like that one over there. It also gives rise to a sense of sangwega. This is the fate of all bodies. No matter how much you might think you'd like to be reborn, better looking, taller, stronger, whatever, everybody eventually deteriorates in the same way. So those are some feelings that arise when you compare your body with the bodies of others, or you contemplate the bodies of others in a skillful way. A sense of dispassion, a sense of heedfulness, a sense of sangwega. There's a similar, similar principle with feelings. As you go through the feelings that go through your mind in the course of the day, you realize there's a lot of pleasure, there's a lot of pain, a lot of ups and downs. And when you can reflect on the fact that other people have the same kinds of feelings. You like your pleasures, you hate your pains, they like their pleasures, they hate their pains. And as the Buddha said, when you reflect on that fact, one, you realize that you wouldn't want to harm them in any way. You feel compassion for them, for all the suffering that they go through, just like you do. It's something we all have in common. Then when you go through intense grief, intense disappointment, the Buddha has you reflect on the fact that other people have met with the same things, the same grief, the same disappointments. The world is not dumping a load on you and you alone. Think of all the people in the world who are losing their loved ones tonight. Meeting with disappointment tonight. If you're suffering from that kind of loss, that kind of disappointment, it's helpful to reflect on the fact that you're not alone. It helps you get away from that particular grief, either with a sense of equanimity, a sense of dispassion, or as the Buddha says, to replacing the, the grief of, of the householder life with the grief of the renunciate life. The grief of the householder life is that you're disappointed in the things that are happening to you. You're upset about them. The grief of the renunciate life is that you realize that you haven't yet reached true happiness, you haven't yet reached nirvana, you haven't yet reached the goal. There's work to be done. The second grief is better because it at least gives you a sense of direction, how to get out of all this. helps to replace grief with basada, sense of conviction that there is a way out, even though you haven't found that way out yet or haven't reached the end of the way. At least you know there is the path. So when we reflect on the feelings of others, contemplate the feelings of others, keep the fact that other people have the same kinds of feelings you do. It helps to give rise to the sense of compassion, a sense of equanimity, 
compassion for other people's feelings, equanimity toward your own feelings. With mind states, it's helped to look at other people. Say, if you're in the midst of really feeling angry, keep in mind that other people are angry too. And what do they like when they're angry? What stupid things do they do? How ugly do they look? When you think about how much you don't like the anger of others, and helps you to get a little distance from your own anger. It gives rise to a sense of shame and compunction, that you don't want to give in to this anger. At the very least, you don't want to take, come out in your words and deeds. And to look for a way that's going to help uproot it so you don't have to suffer from it inside. When you're enjoying good mental states, especially the kind of mental states that come from following the path. It gives rise to a sense of joy. You think about other people who've been on the path, they found these two. Finally, you're beginning to get some of the results that they did. And the Buddha has you appreciate that. It's not something to say, well, I can't, can't be proud, I can't get inflated about this. True. Don't get inflated. Don't compare yourself to people who haven't gotten there yet and say that you're better than they are. But as the Buddha said, when you find good qualities develop in your mind, you say you might think about the devas. They too have those qualities. At the very least, you're beginning to get a little bit above your old level of mind, the old way you used to think, the old way you used to feel. You've raised the level of your mind to the deva level. And the Buddha said that's something good to recollect, something good to think about. It encourages you to develop even more skillful qualities. A similar principle with mental qualities, like the hindrances or the factors for awakening. When you see the hindrances stealing into your mind, the big problem, the Buddha says, is you tend to side with them. You don't recognize them as hindrances. Desire comes into the mind, and you see the object as really being desirable. Ill will comes into the mind. The person you're angry about, the person you're upset about, really does seem to be someone who deserves to suffer. When you're feeling sleepy, oh, the body's telling me, I need to sleep. When you're worrying, you feel that you really have to worry. If you don't worry, then you're neglecting your responsibility. And when you're feeling doubts, you say, yes, this really is a doubtful matter. My doubts are justified. In other words, you side with your hindrances. And one good way of counteracting that tendency is to think about other people who are suffering their hindrances. Over things that seem totally ridiculous to you. People have desires that you don't identify with, that you find strange. People are angry about people that you don't see there's any need for the anger, and so on down the line. It helps pull you out of your own narrow perspective on things. Again, you develop a sense of shame over the hindrances you've been giving into, and you can develop a sense of joy as you develop the factors for awakening in their place. You get those qualities that the famous Ajahns developed, those qualities that all the noble disciples of the path developed, and at last you're beginning to get a taste. Of what took them to true release. So these are some of the ways you can use reflection on other people's bodies, feelings, mind states, mental qualities, keeping these things in mind so you get perspective on your own. And you can develop skillful reactions, skillful attitudes, skillful emotions around them.
heedfulness, sangwega, dispassion, compassion, equanimity, a sense of shame over what's unskillful in your mind, a sense of joy over what is skillful. And ultimately, all of these are meant to lead to a sense of disenchantment, dispassion. As you see that all bodies are equal and impermanent. All feelings are equal and impermanent, whether yours or somebody else's. The same holds true for mind states and mental qualities. No matter, where, no matter where you wander to, no matter what you might crave or cling, it all leads to these same things over and over again. And they're endless, unless you decide to find the way out. And it's not just that you're suffering, because in order to maintain an identity that has a body and feelings and so forth, you need to feed. That's the other great contemplation. What is one? All beings subsist on food. Everybody's feeding on everybody else, physically, emotionally. And they're suffering both for the feeder and the fed upon. We tend to think the person who's feeding is getting satisfaction, but it's, it's a very precarious place to be. That your existence requires that you constantly look for food. Where is there a totally stable, secure food source? They say that the food stores for the world right now, which used to be enough to last for a couple of years in case there was famine, the crops failed. Those have all been eaten up. The food chain that brings food to us is extremely tenuous. Our position as feeders is very insecure. There's a lot of suffering right there. Of course, there's the suffering of the fed upon, both those that are fed upon physically and those fed upon emotionally. So it's useful to think externally in these ways, because if you come to the meditation simply thinking, well, what's in it for me? You've got to train yourself to say, well, what's in it for the whole mass of beings? To what extent can my meditation help them, too? Get you out of that feeding system. There's at least one less mouth to be fed. And in the meantime, you can be an ins inspiration. I'm going to take refuge in the Sangha. It's good to keep having members of the Noble Sangha appearing in the world. And so it's not just a matter of some story way in the past, in the time of the Buddha, or over there in Asia. The members of the Sangha, the members of the Noble Sangha appearing right now, that's an inspiration to other meditators. So we're not doing this just for ourselves, we're doing it for everybody. If we can get to the point where we have less greed, aversion, and delusion, we're not the only ones benefiting. Other people are suffering less from our greed, aversion, and delusion. If we get to the point where we don't have to feed at all, it makes a huge burden off of everyone else. So instead of thinking about yourself and either better than other people or worse than other people, try to compare yourself. Keep these topics in mind in a skillful way so you do develop these healthy attitudes of dispassion, sangwega, heedfulness, compassion, equanimity, shame and compunction, joy. Because these are the attitudes that keep the path alive. And 
and help to keep the possibility for true happiness for all beings alive as well.